Uh, thanks, Deacon Hongkin, and a uh, good morning to all. Uh, do keep your Bibles open to Psalm 2. And let's pray as we begin. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Father in heaven, please help us today to delight in hearing your word, to meditate on it day and night. Help us to be willing to apply your words in our lives and may it shape the way we live. Father, I pray that I'll be faithful to your word and preach it faithfully and clearly. It is your words and you alone that changes hearts. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are Christians losing? Are Christians losing? Nine years ago, the Huffington Post one of the leading online news agencies in the US, they ran an article with this title, Evangelicals and the Wrong Side of History. Now, the point of the article was this. Now, if you were a faithful Christian, if you are faithful to the Word of God, if you hold on to traditional views of marriage, on abortion, on creation, well, according to the article, you are on the wrong side of history. I remember being on a grab ride to church not too long ago, and the driver asked me, hey, you know, don't mind me asking you this, but you know with people becoming more educated, more scientific, don't you think that there's no longer a need for Christianity? No, don't you think that in another 50 years' time, there's no need for religion, much less Christianity. Well, are Christians losing? I hope you can see that the answer to this question is really important because first of all, it's going to affect our mission. You see, if you think that Christianity is losing, well, then of course, you'll be afraid to share the gospel with your friends or your colleagues. Or you might be even tempted to change the difficult parts of the gospel just so you wouldn't offend them. Well, and more than that, it's going to affect our Christian living. Because if you think about it, if Christians lose at the end, well, then what's the point? Well, what's the point of denying yourselves for the gospel? What's the point of sacrificing? So what's the point of striving to be more Christ-like? Well, and more importantly, it affects our hope. Because if Christians lose at the end, but then there's no hope now. And so we need to know where history is heading. But we need to know who wins at the end. No, but actually this question is not a unique question to our time. Now, Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, no, they would have asked this question too. Now, much of Israel's history in the Old Testament, they lived in the shadow of great empires like Egypt, like Babylon, like Persia. Imagine how an Israelite would have felt as he sat in exile in Babylon, looking at the tall and magnificent structures around him. Is it worth it to be faithful to God? Is God more powerful than the, than the gods of Babylon? Our passage for this morning is Psalm 2. Understanding Psalm 2 is really important for us today. Because the psalmist wants to tell us who wins. He wants to tell us who is on the right side of history. And he tells us a story of a rebellion that was formed and God's response to that rebellion. Uh, now at point one, the nations rebel, verse one to three. <laughs> the psalmist describes a world council that is gathered and they plot a rebellion against God. Look with me to verse one. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Well, you see, the nations, the kings and the rulers of the earth, they come together and they plot against God. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. 
The psalmist is describing a situation, world leaders coming together in opposition against God. I wonder if you can see how massive this is. It will be as if Joe Biden, US President, Vladimir Putin, Russian President, Xi Jinping, China's leader, where they call on the rest of the world leaders to come together as a united nation against God. Well, you can imagine them saying this, you know, for the future betterment of humanity, so we aim to set up a world where there is no God, no pastors, no churches, and we, and we achieve this by eradicating Christianity, the hateful and bigoted religion. So this is a massive council planning a universal rebellion. But what is this council's plan? Right, their plan is to be free from God. Look at verse 3. Uh, they say this, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But you see, they're describing God as a slave master. Uh, they say God binds them with chains. God limits their freedom. Uh, so they say, let us be free from God. And I think this is really applicable to modern times. You know, 50 years ago, a large part of society, well, they felt that God should be kept out of the bedroom. Well, and so the sexual revolution was born. Well, according to this article, there were rapid shifts in public discourse and norms regarding sex during that time. Uh, well, the media was allowed to show sexually explicit content, uh, premarital sex, pornography, they were normalized. A uh, Playboy magazine became part of everyday culture. Well, until today, we are still feeling its effects. Uh, strong voices all over society, even from self-professed Christians, who say that the LGBT lifestyle should be accepted and deemed not sinful. But if you stop to think about it, well, it's foolish, isn't it? So wanting to be free from God is just like a fish wanting to be free from water. Now imagine a fish in an aquarium saying this to its owner. You know, I'm so constrained by this water around me. Let me be free. Let me be out of this water. I'd rather be on the floor instead. Now you would think it's, it's ridiculous. Because you know that a fish, when it's out of water, it will suffocate and die. But this is what the world tries to do. Because right from the beginning, the Bible tells us God created the world. But every square inch on this planet is created by Him. Where everything from the stars in the sky down to every single molecule in our bodies, the laws of physics are in place so that life could exist. And God created man to be like Him, to reflect His glory. God gave humanity everything they needed, everything they needed to live life, and enjoy life to the fullest, God gave it all. So a picture of God and man in loving relationship. And but the Bible also tells us that well, we reject God by trying to live life our own way. We ignore Him, we refuse to listen to Him. We don't listen to His instructions in His world. Well, and what's the result? we make a terrible, terrible mess of our own lives and the lives of others. But the consequences of the sexual revolution were, were severe. Uh, this article makes the point, the liberation of women and of sexuality in the 1960s has not resulted in the elimination of sexual harms, but its escalation. And what people thought was sexual freedom, but it was more sexual abuse. And another article from MSNBC, where well, they made this observation. The lingering image of the summer of love has been one of bare-breasted flower children making love in petrolly scented crash pads, sharing their food, their money, and their partners. The real story is more complex. Many problems have been glossed over, not least of which was the soaring rate of sexually transmitted diseases. There was a price for all that free love. From 1964 through 1968, the rates of syphilis and gonorrhea in California rose 165%, according to published reports. Now, friends, living life in rebellion to God is utter 
folly. Oh, yet the world refuses and they plot against God. Well, I think the rebellion of the world against God is, is a big reason why we face difficulty in evangelism. Oh, the world hates the idea of a God who tells them how to live, but because they'd rather be free. When the world gathers, plots against God, but what is God's response? Now my second point, God's response, he laughs, he sets his king on the throne to rule and judge, verse 4 to 9. And now how will you expect God to respond to all this? And how will God respond to a rebellion? Well, God simply sits in his seat and he laughs. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. The word derision contains the idea of mockery or ridicule or scoffing. Well, did you expect God to laugh at them? All of the world's leaders gathered together with all their weapons and all their plans, and God simply sits in his seat and laughs. Uh, it's like this. I, I have two very cute nephews. Uh, one of them is eight and the other is four. Uh, every week they will come over to, to my house and they will hang out with me and, my, uh, and their grandparents. They own a very old uh, console game and on this console game, they, they have this very old game called Street Fighter. Uh, every week these boys, my nephews, they will come up to me and they will challenge me. You know, you can imagine them, uh, two young boys in their excitement telling me that this week, this will be the week that they defeat me in the game. Uh, telling me, you know, they've learned, they've just learned these new moves to defeat me. Well, and I'll just sit down every time and say, okay, well, let's, let's play. Uh, sometimes I like to make the game appear very close. You know, let them get in a few hits here and there. Uh, sometimes I just let them win just one match. Uh, but just when they thought they were going to beat me, <laughs> I commence my full assault. I start throwing fireballs and jump all over and kick them. Well, it's complete decimation. And sometimes my dad, he will stand behind and he'll come and spectate this match and he'll start laughing. But if you think that crushing little boys in Street Fighter is, is funny, well, the nation's rebellion against God, it's a comedy. Well, just to clarify here, I'm not saying that God is Machiavellian. If anything, I'm the Machiavellian one. Well, God's judgment is always measured, it's always fair. But let's not miss the point. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Don't you think it's funny going up against God? God laughs at his enemies. Uh, verse 4 tells us God's reaction. Uh, verses 5 to 9 tell us what God will do. And God's response is this, to set his king on the throne to rule and judge. Verse 5, Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. At the heart of God's response to a rebellious world is Jesus, is to set his son, Jesus, on the throne. When I look at verse 7, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Well, at this point you might ask, you know, when is the day that Jesus, the eternal son of God, when is, when is the day that he's declared to be the Son of God in power? Uh, are you saying, no, is this verse telling us that Jesus was born on a particular day? Uh, that there was a point of time where he didn't exist and a point of, of the time where he existed? Well, the answer to this question comes in Acts 13. Uh, because Paul tells us in Acts 13 that, the, that, that it is the moment when Jesus fulfills God's promises uh, and rules in power. Look at what Paul says. Uh, Acts 13, verse 32. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Well, in Paul's sermon, in Acts 13, quoting Psalm 2, well, the day that Jesus is declared to be the son of God in power, well, that is Resurrection Sunday. But the words here are a decree, a, a declaration by the Lord himself. Well, think of it as a coronation, the day when the prince now takes up his inheritance and his title as king. 
for Jesus Christ the King. So after making purification for our sins through his death and resurrection, he now sits on the eternal throne at the right hand of God. Now after his resurrection, Jesus declares that all power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And the risen and victorious King Jesus, now he is God's answer to this rebellion. Now, but how much power does Jesus have? Just how much power does he have? Look at verse 8. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Now, every nation belongs to Jesus. Every corner of the earth belongs to Jesus the King. Now, all of the 510 million square kilometers, all of the 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet, all the 20 quintillion animals, all of that, now, all of that belongs to Jesus. But the thing is this, Jesus will not tolerate rebellion against his rule. But Jesus won't let rebels run his world and damage it. But we can be assured that Jesus will judge his enemies. Look at verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And this is strong, severe, solemn language. So his enemies will be struck down, crushed in tiny pieces. I used to have a very fierce English teacher back in secondary school. Uh, he's a very old uh, British man. And something that he likes to do, he likes to track it. So I remember on the first day of secondary one, when we all entered class, we took our seats. And the first thing he said was to issue a warning. He said this, if any of you dare to climb over my head, I will smack you down. And all of us just sat there frozen in our seats. Well, the same is with Jesus. We might not usually think of Jesus as judge, but the Bible is clear. Jesus, the perfectly righteous, holy one, he will judge. He will call the world to account for their actions. Now, oftentimes we, we, we look at those who oppose Jesus and we feel afraid and frightened. And sometimes we might even think, you know, God is just ruler of heaven. You know, he has no control over the earth. No, but no. No. The world belongs to Jesus. He rules. And Jesus is there in the classroom when our youths get ridiculed for saying openly that they are Christian. But he is there at our workplace when there's just so much pressure to conform. But he's even there on the internet. He knows every hateful comment spoken in rebellion against him. And Jesus will judge. At this point, some of you may wonder, hmm, hey, God's response, it is slightly odd. Uh, we would have expected God to just crush the rebellion immediately after verse 3. Uh, but instead, God's response is to set his king on his hill, who will judge his enemies at the end of time. Well, notice the phrase here, you shall break them with a rod of iron. Well, it appears here, and this language gets picked up in Revelation. Look at Revelation 2. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. It's Revelation 2, 27. And Revelation 19, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Now, is there judgment? Well, yes. About when? In the future. Well, this means there is a delay. God has set his king on his throne, but there's still a chance. A chance for the nations to come ally themselves with Jesus. And this leads to the final point. But our response, we want verses 10 to 12. Well, God gives an opportunity an opportunity for the rebellious nations to come, to respond to the king. Now notice the linking word, therefore, in verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Therefore, 
kings and rulers be wise. Now, the only wise option here is to serve the Lord and kiss the Son. You might not understand the, the expression kiss the Son, uh, but the phrase carries the meaning of declaring your allegiance to the king. Now, think of it in medieval times where loyal subjects kissed the ring of the king uh, to declare publicly that they are allied with this king. That was the same here. Well, and this response makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because if Jesus rules over every inch of the universe, well, in the day of judgment, there's nowhere you can run. You should run to the case, Jesus will be there. Run to the deepest parts of the ocean, well, Jesus is there. Try to escape to outer space, well, Jesus will find you. There is but one safe space in all of this. And that is taking refuge in Jesus alone. So that is why the psalm begins with this question, why do the nations rage? Why do they oppose God? The only wise choice is to take refuge in Jesus. Verse 12, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, King Jesus, he has opened an invitation even to the rebellious nations, even to those who take counsel and plot against him. He invites them now to be wise. Take refuge in the Lord's anointed. Well, you see, the heart of God's response is Jesus. There was a time 2,000 years ago where God sent his son, Jesus, to this world. Although he was a king, he was born in a lowly manger. He was rejected by men, but he willingly gave his life for the sake of rebels like you and me. So he hung on a Roman cross to take our place. But on the third day, Jesus rose. He claims victory over sin and death, and now he sits at God's right hand in power. Now, the heart of God's amazing response to rebels is this take refuge in his son. Well, and don't be mistaken, because there is now one fundamental difference between all of the humans in this world. Well, it's not our race, it's not our skin color, not our class, high or low, not our level of education. The one thing that truly matters now is this, our response to Jesus. Well, either citizens in his kingdom or rebels. Now, let me conclude all that we've covered. Now, Psalm 2 has shown us that there are only two ways to live, either in submission to the Son or as rebels who will face his judgment. Well, I hope you can see how important Psalm 2 is. Now, because Psalms 1 and 2, they form the introduction to the rest of the Psalter. Uh, do you see that the start and end of Psalms 1 and 2 are similar? Right? They both begin and end with the word blessed. Right? Psalm 1 verse 1, blessed is the man. And Psalm 2 verse 12, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Well, I think they serve as a challenge to us as we preach through the 10 other Psalms this year. But will we choose the blessed life? Or will we choose the happy life? which delights in the word of God, which responds in submission to the Son, and will we choose that? No, but more importantly, Psalms 1 and 2, will they shape our entire worldview. Right? It's going to affect every single life decision that we make, right? from the schools we choose to go, the jobs we take, how we spend our time, how we spend our money. My friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, we live in God's world. And we must live according to God's design, delighting in His Word, responding in submission to His Son. I think there are two major ways which we can apply Psalm 2. And number one, be warned, submit to Jesus now. And the main point of the psalm was this, Jesus is King, and rebellion against Him will surely be crushed. And so our response today is to be wise. Heed the psalmist's warning. Take refuge 
in Jesus before it's too late. Now for some of us here, this may be the first time you're hearing the Christian message and we are glad you came. Because if we turn to God, appeal to his mercy, if we repent of our rebellion, if we trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus, well then everything changes. Everything changes. God wipes our slate clean. He accepts Jesus' death as payment for our sins. And now God freely and completely forgives us. And we'll no longer be rebels in his world, but children. Children in God's family with Jesus as our compassionate and loving ruler. I also seek the king. Well, he yet may be found. Well, maybe you have some questions after this. You know, can I be sure that Jesus is a real person? Can I trust the Bible? Well, that's okay. Uh, but can I urge you, if this is new to you, please go and investigate more. Well, ask a friend or family member who brought you here. I'm sure they will be able to answer your questions and help you. No, but uh, for those of us who have taken refuge in Jesus, well, the psalmist does want us to and to serve the Lord with fear. And I think this involves all of our lives. Uh, Pastor Joshua has, has, re- has mentioned repeatedly, right, that Christianity isn't a say a prayer, go to heaven religion. A true faith, true allegiance, well, it means that we are completely on Jesus' side. But there's no such thing as having a foot in two camps. It's a total com- commitment. And for some of us, there might still be areas where we have not submitted to Jesus. But it might be areas of, of godliness where we need to, to submit to Jesus. It may be priorities in our lives that, that needs to change. Maybe relationships that need to be foregoed. Jesus demands complete, complete allegiance to him. And I think two things that might hinder us from this, two things that might stop us. Now, first, we might think, hey, you know, is this slavish obedience? Is this kind of like the, what the nations were accusing God of in verse 1 to 3, you know, that God is too restrictive? But no, we must remember that the truly blessed or the truly happy life well, is one that submits to Jesus. But recall from Psalm 1 and 2, right? The psalmist wants us to have a happy life. He wants us to live a blessed life. Well, and he thinks that the blessed life is one that delights in God's word and responds in submission to his son. Now, because we said throughout, we live in God's world. And we live in God's way. Well, that's the truly happy life. And this puts us on the right side of history. A second, we might be thinking, is this worth it? You know, is it worth sacrificing my time? Is it worth denying myself, denying the pleasures which I just want to do? But Psalm 2 tells us it is. It is worth it. Because if we are on this side, if we are on the right side with Jesus, we are on the right side of history. And then there's no risk too great, no sacrifice too much. But one day Jesus will establish his reign over the entire universe. And on that day, we will be joyous, joyous citizens in his kingdom. And we have so much more certainty than the original readers of Psalm 2. Now, because Jesus has already risen, he has been victorious over the grave. When one day everything things in heaven and things on earth will be put under Jesus' feet. Of course it's worth it. What's the risk? Well, lastly, we ought to be assured we are winning. Be assured we are winning. Well, we started today by asking this question. Are Christians losing? I hope the answer is clear from Psalm 2. Are we losing? Well, certainly not. But no matter what culture and society try to tell us, why well, it shouldn't affect us, it shouldn't affect our mission. But the fact that we are winning, well, that should make us even more bold in evangelism. And, and I just want to tell you um, how the earliest Christians, how the earliest Christians applied the words of Psalm 2. Right? And this story is taken from Acts. Uh, turn with me to Acts 4. Uh, 
Uh, well, at this point in Acts, uh, Christians, they've, they've just begun to preach the gospel. And already, um, they've already made people very angry. Uh, verse 2 tells us, you know, many of the Jewish religious leaders, they were greatly annoyed at these Christians for teaching and proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead. And so Peter and John, right, the apostles, uh, they were hauled up to the courts. And the courts gave their judgment, verse 18, and the court judgment. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But so imagine there comes a day where Christianity isn't accepted by society anymore, that there's no room to be preaching the gospel anywhere. But well, imagine what if, what if one day we get an email from the HR department telling us don't preach the gospel anymore? Well, what if a day comes where school policies change, where evangelism and telling others the gospel uh, is banned entirely on our school campuses? Well, what if that day comes? And how should we respond? And on that day, what, what will we pray for? Well, I could um, imagine we will, we will pray for protection. Oh, dear God, please protect us. And how might we have acted? Maybe, maybe we might have said, okay, uh, since there's just so much backlash, let's just all cool it off. Let's just stop all evangelism for this year. Uh, and then we'll see how. Now, but what did the early church pray? Well, they prayed the words of Psalm 2. Now look at Acts 4. In verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of, your, of, of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Oh, and here's their prayer. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. How oh, the church prayed for boldness. Oh, they had confidence in the sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And now they call upon the Lord to look upon their threats and grant them boldness. In verse 31, they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Well, of course, this landed them in jail in Acts 5. But you can't miss this refrain throughout the entire book of Acts. The word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Well, and here we are, with Christians all over the globe. Well, may we have the same confidence as the psalmist in Psalm 2. May we have the same confidence as the early Christians in Acts. We are on the right side of history. And we must speak the gospel with all bonus. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for your word. We thank you for the truth of Psalm 2. We thank you for Jesus, our King. We thank you for your mercy in giving us a chance, a chance for the rebellious nations, a chance for us to respond in submission to you. Our Father, we pray that we will respond lightly in whatever areas of life which we have not yet submitted. And please help us and please also grant us boldness to preach the gospel. Father, I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.